Thanks for letting me join you guys this morning. Everybody doing good? Yeah. You sounded like it. You look like it. <laughs> Amen. Father, we just thank you this morning. What an honor to be in your presence. Just what an honor that we can gather together and know that you're here. You're in us and you dwell in us and you walk among us. Father, I just thank you that every one of our attention right now is, is on the honor that you love us and you call us family and you've made us sons and daughters through the blood of Jesus Christ. Let that be very real to every heart today. Let no heart feel disconnected or forgotten. And I just thank you that your love permeate us and your good news overtake us. And I thank you that your power of your spirit would come in this house and touch every single heart. I thank you that there's no one here that feels like they're in a corner. I thank you, God. You come and reveal your goodness in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Good deal. I don't remember the last time I prayed before I preached, but I just did. So <laughs> you, were you surprised? <laughs> I just live. We live in relationship and fellowship. It's not wrong to pray before you preach. It's just not something I normally do. I do that during worship and I kneel and I just have a good time. But I just felt that in my heart. I don't know where to go, man. I feel like I'm way up high. Can I come down? Yay. <laughs> Coming off the mountain. <laughs> Every mountain's down, every valley's up. We're all in the same plane. We all need the blood of Jesus. We all need the mercy of God. There's no high, hot shot. There's no low life. Everybody's valuable. Everybody's precious and everybody's important to the kingdom of God. In fact, if your face isn't on the picture, something's missing. And God wants you there. Amen? I'm just real excited. I want to cheer you on this morning. Uh, I think you're already cheered on, but I just hopefully can add to that. Amen? There's a reason you gather on Sunday. It's not because it's Sunday. It's not because that's what Christians do. You assemble yourselves together to stir one another in love and good works. You don't just come to have fun. You don't just come to rub elbows. There's a lot of reasons we gather. But the Bible says to stir one another up in love and good works. I believe it's very important to have such purpose when we gather together in the sense of meeting him, being touched by him, increased by him, so that when we leave, we look more like him than when we came. And in that process, you love each other, you pray for each other, you worship with all your heart, and you connect, and you rub elbows. That's all good. But it's very important to know that when you walk out of here, nothing changes. It's increased. You don't turn anything on, off. You don't take anything off. You've put something on, more of Him. It's very important. And I want to talk to you about something that's on my heart right now. In the beginning... When God made man, what did God say? Let us make man what? In his image. And in the likeness of God, he what? He made man. So you can find that man's created value is the image of God. Now we have a problem because all of us were born into the fall of man, into Adam. And we were born up in the wisdom of the world and the way that seems right to man. And our feelings, our emotions, our frustrations, our jealousies, our pride has all become normal to us. And we tend to think that's who we are. But it was never who we were in the first place. Every man was born into Adam after Adam's sin. The Bible teaches in Romans 5 that every man was born into Adam. And Jesus says you must be born again. What's he talking about? A prayer to go to heaven? He's talking about a transformation of life. He's talking about getting you back before Adam ate the tree. Back restored by the grace of God. By the mercy of God. To what we were predestined to be before time. When he made man breathing into that dust. What man was before that tree is what Christ restores us back to. It's called the redemption of man. Redemption means brought back and bought back to original value. Christianity is not a passport to heaven. It's heaven getting back inside of mankind. Christianity is not God blessing us and showing us favor and just making our way. It's transforming our nature and putting who he is inside of us in such a way that who he is shines through us. City on a hill. It's a big deal. It's lights that are shining in the world 24-7. It's love that's turned on and never turns off. Why? Because love never fails. Love's not a decision. Love's not an attitude. Love is love. Love is what you become. It's all you see. It's all you are. It's your only option. Love is in a wide view lens. It's a single eye. It's not I love you. Do you love me? It's I love you. Period. 
And the whole goal, 1 Timothy 1, 5 of our instruction is love. The whole goal of the commandment is not just to have a good time. It's becoming love and understanding that love was modeled before us when Christ came. And he modeled a life that we were designed for. And he didn't just say, sing to me or pray to me. He said, follow me. It's a big deal, guys. I am so excited that the days of frustration and anger and bitterness and selfishness are over for me forever. I don't deal with it. I don't fight with it. I don't have my moments. I have surrendered and grown up into him. For 17 years, I'm having the time of my life. I understand what freedom is. Freedom is free from myself. Free from me needing you to be something so I'm okay. Freedom is me being fulfilled in Christ and complete because of him so that I can finally have healthy relationship with you. Are you following me? I'm just challenging your spirit and stirring you up. To look real deep inside and say, you know what? The reason I'm on the planet is to look like my father. I'm not on the planet to be blessed. I'm on the planet to bear witness of his image. Let us make man in our image. That's man's created value. It's the reason God put us on the earth to to shine his image. Are you following me? So the Christian life isn't an answer for blessings. It's an answer for transformation. Because everything we were before Christ was an absolute lie. So the day of frustration and anger and stuff ought to be over for us forever. I've pastored for years. I've tried to settle a lot of things in the church. And all of a sudden I realize we don't really understand the gospel. We have too many issues. We ought to have Jesus. We have too many rights. Too many opinions. And it proves that we have the form of something without becoming that. And it doesn't mean we're evil. It means we don't understand the whole picture. And I'm not saying that that's you today. I'm not here to spank you. I'm here to call your heart into a stewardship of this truth so you can make full use of the grace that's on this planet. Because we can walk in him, church. I can lay down my life for his name's sake and become love in a place of prayer where Holy Spirit fashions me. And I can rest myself in the hand of the great potter so he can make me with his creativity the masterpiece I was designed to be. Where I can look at you with sincere heart. Where I can look at you through sincere eyes. Where I can look at you without first judgment, first impressions. And see that every man is worthy of the blood of Jesus because he was made for God's glory. On your darkest day, church, God didn't lose sight of who you were. On your most rebellious moment, God said, that ain't you. I know who you are and I know what you're made for. See, the gospel is such a revealing of man's value. It's not a revealing of man's sin. It's a removing of man's sin. The cross removes man's sin. It doesn't expose man's sin. It removes man's sin to expose his value and his created purpose. The cross brings destiny back into the picture. You can write legacy again. Yay. I don't have to be disheartened. I don't have to let life speak louder than truth. I can live by faith. I can have fellowship with God and relationship. Take off the veil and be with him. Nothing can keep me from that place. No man has the power. That's why I'm happy. I said the other day, I don't know when it was. We've been preaching all week. But don't think in 17 years you don't experience life. We all experience life. Life comes and goes. The storms come to the wise and foolish. You have to understand why you're on the planet or life will start defining you slowly and subtly and you'll be pottered by circumstances instead of truth. And all of a sudden you're a person in need instead of a person filled with the Spirit. All of a sudden this thing's all about you and God taking care of you instead of God transforming you and making you like Him in the heat of the fire. To where when you're facing injustice, all you know is mercy and truth and forgiveness and loving kindness. When you're faced with unfairness, you don't have a bunch of rights. You have Jesus. And you have the Holy Ghost in you that overtakes people in situations and covers things with grace. You don't have anger, frustration, regret. You have the kingdom of God. It's inside of you. It's not a Christian principle we shout about. It's something we live. It's every one of our destiny. It's every one of our created purpose. Every one of us has the value of the blood of Jesus over our lives. God knows who every one of you are because there's a time to be born and here you sit. Life is not an accident and you're not a mistake. 
God knows you well. And he already paid the price for your redemption. Christ isn't coming. He's already come. <laughs> that settles it. You're amazing to God. He would have not paid a high price if you didn't have high value. He didn't die because you were a sinner. He had to die because you sinned. He died because you're a lost son and he wants you back in the family. And he wants his spirit back in you and his nature back in you and his purpose fulfilled through you. You did not sign a passport to heaven when you prayed a prayer of salvation. You bought into a transformed life. Yeah. Are you following me? So the days of unforgiveness are over. Frustration are over. Offense is not permissible. You shouldn't even consider it. You should crush it in your own soul, in your own temptations with God and never justify it because it's never God. Because if God was offended, he wouldn't have sent his son and you wouldn't be sitting here filled with his spirit. And if he loved you this way, we ought to love others this way. The Bible says that. Why is that true? Because if that's not true, then we want him to forgive everything we've ever done and don't want to become that same forgiveness. That would be selfish. For me to want God to forgive me of everything I've ever done and hold you accountable for something to where I lose sight of your value, your potential, and just judge you for a weakness would be deception. How could I expect God to love me and forgive me of everything I've ever done and not want to become that towards men? Matthew 18 calls that evil and wicked, tormented in outer darkness. That doesn't sound too good. I'm not even saying it means you're going to hell. It means your life's in bondage because you don't see clear and you want something you're not willing to become. This gospel is all about transformation. Each seed producing after its own kind. The seed of God's spirit comes inside of you and he wants to reproduce himself after his own kind. A seed died and fell to the ground, sprung up and it's bearing much fruit. We're Christians. Little Christ-like ones all over the earth that are walking in love, walking free. Doing good things, praying for the sick, blessing folks. Not frustrated by crowds and traffic and people and the cashier that's moving too slow. We're loving one another. Because if we're not careful, we'll do all the right things this way. And this is huge. Because the only way the world is going to see him is through his people. God's doing a good thing in his church. I believe it. I believe he's deepening us with purpose. He's taking the offense out of our hearts. This stuff's in me everywhere I travel. I know people want other sermons sometimes, but it's not what we want. It's what we need. <laughs> you can't let anything define you, people. You can't let life potter you and fashion you. You can't let the words of a man or the lack of the words of a man define your heart. Christ has come. Do you get it? Christ has come and said, this is who you are. This determines your value. This is where you start and this is where you finish. We just sang that you're my everything and all I need is you. We just sang it. It's not okay to sing it and not have it true. That's called religion. <laughs> are you guys okay if I'm talking this plain? Okay, you don't want me to like preach something rosy, right? Okay, good, because I can't. <laughs> so you just have to sit me down, get another speaker. Because <laughs> I'm not going to just give you something rosy. I'm, can you tell I'm not mad at anybody? Can you tell I'm not spanking you? I'm cheering you on and saying, let's understand why he lives in us. Let's understand why his son died on the cross. I'm concerned that some of us think it's just all about us being blessed. It's all about us being transformed. Because if it's all about you just being blessed, your life doesn't seem blessed. You're discouraged and you got a ton of questions. And then all your faith is being used to try to get that breakthrough and that blessing that you think it's all about. No, it's all about you having peace with God and you shining like light and you walking in love and showing mercy and making peace. In the face of trouble and trial and fires. Come on, people have run through stop signs and demolished and crushed my cars. That doesn't mean I'm walking outside of grace and God's not protecting me. Once the metal crashes, that's when he shines. 
It's not on the curb sitting, oh God, why'd you let this happen? What did I do wrong? Why aren't you protecting me? That is not Christianity. That is self-centered deception. (laughs) Are we okay? (laughs) I'm a humble guy. Sit me down if you have to. Come on, when these things happen, we take it personal and it proves that we don't understand who we've become. And we always have a reason, if we're not careful, because of life, to be less than who he says we are in him. And all that's causing that is a lack of perception and a lack of understanding. When that metal crashes, Christ sure ought to shine. It's not about, didn't you see the stop sign? Why didn't you stop? If they saw the stop sign, we wouldn't be sitting like this. (laughs) It's not about looking at your car, shrugging your shoulders, dragging your foot, and then going to try to tell them why it's okay. You already showed them it's not. Come on, these things are real. They happen to us. And we respond a lot of times like the world taught us, but we've incorporated Christ in and we're good people and we're not mean in harm, but we get ruled by a lot of things that have nothing to do with who we are. But who we are is supposed to be released in those things. Are you guys okay? Because if somebody just gets in your face and tells you off, You better be formed in Christ or you're just going to react like a man that says they believe in Jesus, but you're still just a man. You're going to pray things like, God, I wish you'd change my boss. If you love me, why do you let him spew on me like that? That'll be your prayer. That is not Christian prayer. That's feeling sorry for yourself and thinking he's your problem. How about loving your boss and crying for him and asking God to open his eyes so he sees the value of his life and others? You're not praying for God to knock him off his high horse. You're showing him Jesus through your life. And you're letting your life convict him. You're not upset because God's letting him talk to you that way. (laughs) Come on. Because if that's the best we can do, you're telling the devil, just keep poking me because it's working big and you got me in derision. And I'll still go to church and I'll sing loud, but I won't be happy. Are you guys okay with me? (laughs) I've just decided to live this way 17 years ago. I went to church till I was 20, but then when I was 33, I got born again. It's true. I went to church till I was 20. And the last church I went was spirit-filled, and I sang loud and raised both hands because everybody else did. But I never encountered God, never sought God, never prayed to God, never asked Him to transform me, never told Him my life is His. I just went to church to connect and find identity. I went there to feel loved and accepted. Gave me another circle of friends. But I never sought Jesus. I just rubbed elbows with people that looked happy. And it made me feel like I fit in. But I had no ability to answer life with him. So life swallowed me up. Like it does a lot of folks. But thank God when I was 33, Jesus came. Save my life forever. I'm undone now. I'm playing it real cool for you guys. Actually, I'm staying very subdued. <laughs> no, no, I, I am. No, no, because I have to relate. I don't, I'm not here to freak anybody out. But I'm 10 times more on the inside than you're seeing, I promise. I'm in this thing. I'm a soldier. I'm surrendered. I'm a no-nonsense man. You are not going to change the Jesus in me, but you will get touched by him. I tell people, if you're not ready for change, don't do me wrong. Because if you do me wrong, I won't get mad at you. I will cry for you. Because if you do me wrong, you don't know who you are. And that hurts my heart for you. And if you do me wrong, you don't know who I am. And that means you're in deception and you're blind. And I will cry for you in a bedroom when nobody's looking. I won't cry because of you. I won't call a friend and say, pray for me. They hurt me. I died a long time ago, friend. I denied myself a long time. I didn't pray a prayer to go to heaven. I denied myself. I picked up my cross and I'm following love. (laughs) And when I'm in my bedroom praying, he will hear my prayers because they're coming from the right place. Not complaining. Compassion. You know what Holy Spirit will do? He'll come and go get that injustice and touch that person. He'll come get you in the middle of the night. Oh, he'll start working on you. (laughs) If you ain't ready for change, don't mess with me. Because I will love you into the kingdom. 
I promise you. I could tell you so many stories. You would sit there with your mouth open. I could tell you some really fun stories. <laughs> if you're not ready for salvation, don't do me wrong. Because <laughs> he will come and get you. Because he loves you. And so do I. You will not see the day where I'm hurt needing ministry. Because people aren't treating me right. Of course they're not. They don't know who they are. Forgive them, Father. They don't know what they do. I didn't see Jesus going, God, are you kidding me? I healed other sick and this is the best they can do for me. I'm a little tired of this, you know. They're a bunch of stiff neck. Why do we love them anyway? Let's regroup and think this over. I mean, if they didn't change by now, are they ever going to change? They're just a bunch of losers. I don't see Jesus doing that on the cross. I see Jesus saying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. But if I model love, somebody might see. Somebody might yield. If I be lifted up, I could draw men unto me. And somebody might change. And all of a sudden, love might get reproduced and cover the earth with your glory, God. So I'll lay down my life for them no matter what it looks like. Because I believe your love is greater than what they seem. And I'm going to take the hit so they can rise up. What's love do? Lays down its life for everyone. It doesn't get hurt and offended and need ministry, counsel, and prayer. <laughs> Trying to help you, buddy. <laughs> You'd be amazed how I counsel people when they come to me. Hurt and all this stuff. And I talk to them straight up. Well, let me ask you a question. Why are you so hurt? Well, didn't you hear what they did to me? Well, yeah, I did. But why are you so hurt? Why aren't you hurting for them? Did you even consider crying for them? Because if they did that to you, they don't know who they are. Man, they're the one in trouble, not you. They're in trouble. They're blind or willful or rebellious or something. You're not a victim. They're in trouble. Come on. If God sat on the throne and was victimized by humanity, he'd have never sent his son. He's not a victim of your sin. He's the father of creation and he loves you and he never lost sight of what he made you to be. So he sent his son to get us out of the mess. Not just to bless us and make us feel fuzzy and take us to heaven someday, but to put himself back inside of us so we can fulfill what we're on the planet for in the first place. And it's not to feel good, it's to become love. But when you become love, you feel good in the face of everything. Because you see clear. The last lady that came through a stop sign and crashed my car, it was a brand new truck. People bought it for me as a gift. Nobody ever bought me a truck. It was pretty humbling. I'm the kind of guy that buys one a couple years old and runs it till it's dead and then prays over it to live. The one I was driving when they bought me the new truck was 13 years old. Toyota, they just keep going. I'm just running this toy and I liked it. It was just a fine fitting thing for me. It was just like a nice pair of pants or something for me. I didn't want to get rid of it. I like one of them starry eyed intercessors. I'm not making fun of them. They hear God. She walked up to me. I heard the Lord for you. I said, just stay away from me. Just stay back. Talk to me from there. I said, what do you hear? She said, so I love these girls. They're amazing. She said, he said, you need a new truck. I said, honey, you didn't hear God. I'm not even thinking new truck. I don't need, I love my truck. No, you're getting a new truck. I said, okay. And I'm not really taking her serious. I didn't know I was about ready to travel about 25, 30,000 miles a year and minister all over the place. I didn't know I was about ready to be released into something different. And this old truck I had probably wasn't the best thing. So these people put money in an account and got me a brand new truck. I'm only driving it three months. I was so humbled by it. When I drove it off the lot, I, I didn't need a truck. I wasn't coveting a truck. So I was overwhelmed and humbled by it. I wasn't like, yes, wow, wow, my baby. Woohoo. I was just like, what? I was just driving down the road crying, saying, God, this is your love. This is people's love. This is overwhelming. This is really cool. Three months later, this lady drove through a stop sign and just Pow, that pretty little truck. Spun me around, threw me up in the grass. She just made a mistake. She pulled up to the stop sign, looked this way, saw a big long line of traffic and the one in the front was turning and she thought, oh, I can go. And forgot there's another direction. 
And I'm coming 35 to 40 and never touched my brakes. And I didn't want to T-bone him, so I tried to whip in front of her. She caught my front wheel well, went across my passenger side, smashed the bed. It was, oh, she hurt my little truck. Spun that thing, threw me in the yard. Everything went white. I wasn't in heaven. It was my airbag. <laughs> I knew because I looked and didn't see Jesus. I was, airbag. <laughs> so, so I busted out my airbag and was over at their car. If you saw it on video, I don't know what it must have looked like, but it's just the way you think. When, when you see, you can't, you can't let the metal crash and then try to apply the sermons you hear pastor preach. You have to become it when the metal crashes. Because if the metal crashes, you're going to try to serve doctrine instead of become doctrine. You're going to try to be okay instead of be okay. And you're a day late. And you're going to go, okay, okay. I'm supposed to, okay. I'm supposed to be all right. I'm supposed to love them. I'm supposed to be angry. Supposed, okay, I got to I'm trying. That's right. Jesus, example. Light of the world. City on the hill. Hey, everybody. Is that right? That's weird. That's, that's plastic. And inside, you're like, I can't believe she hit me. Oh, my God. No, it'll work out. Oh, come on. There's no power in that. When that metal crashes, you don't even want that capacity. You want to have been with him and intimate with him. And who he is has come inside of you. And you've been together. And you've yielded and you've surrendered. And that wonderful Holy Spirit has fashioned you. And when the metal crashes, Jesus is all there is. Are you following me? And you don't have to think about your response because you've become the response. You don't have to try to be okay because you love God and love people. And it's not about you. And it's sure not about your pretty little truck. It's about people. It's about love. And I promise you one day we'll all realize her soul is more important than that truck or my inconvenience. One day we'll realize it as a whole. Men's souls are more important than our stuff. I busted out of that airbag. I ran over to that car. I said, sir, he's in the passenger side. He's the guy I thought I was going to T-bone. If God wouldn't intervene and I would have T-boned him, I'd have killed them. It was a young girl and a passenger and I was going right at them. And I was so glad to see that they hit me. When I ran up to the car, I realized I didn't T-bone them. They crashed me. I didn't know how it happened. I just know it was like I was on an amusement park ride for about two seconds. And then I'm over at their car. And I'm like, hey, man, I want to pray for you. I want to bless you. Look, that was a heavy impact. I just want to make sure you're okay, that there's no kinks, no hurt, no pain. Father, in Jesus' name, I have my hand on his head, hand on his heart, and I'm just blessing. The girl is bawling in the backseat, bawling uncontrollably. I reached in, honey, it's okay, sweetie. Honey, Jesus loves you. Jesus makes all things right. I run around to the lady. I said, honey, I really just want to bless you. I need to pray for you. And she's just staring out the window. Well, I didn't know, but this wasn't her car. It was her daughter's. A week before, she demolished hers. She just turned 65. Now, what do you think pressure is on her right now? She just turned 65. This is the stuff we don't know. But if we value our lives more than others, if we love our lives more than others, instead of taking the burden off of men, we will put another weight on them. Because we'll think for ourselves and not for them. And the mind of Christ thinks for them. Watch this. I don't even need prayer right now, guys. Pray for me. I was in an accident. What is that? Why, do we, why are we so vulnerable? What do you mean pray for me? I was in an accident. No, I'm in Christ. Pray for me. I'll get worse. <laughs> I said to her, honey, I need to pray for you. She's staring out the window and she says, oh, no. It's a brand new truck. I still had a little temporary thing in the window and she just realized that she hit a brand new truck. To her, that meant something. To me, I'm thinking, what? I said, honey, I, it sounded so rhetorical to her. I said, honey, it's okay. It's just a truck. Thank God you're okay. I want to pray for you. She said, looked at me so mean, mad. She said, you don't understand. That is a brand new truck. And I'm going, 
Okay. Okay. She said, that driver is going to be so mad at me. And I said, honey, I am the driver. And she burst out in tears and said, oh, God bless you. Why? Because she's carrying so much weight, so much responsibility, so much guilt, so much condemnation. And Jesus takes that off of men, doesn't add it to men. Jesus doesn't hold you accountable for your sins when you repent. Why am I angry at her for missing a stop sign? She's a human being. And she has the value of the blood of Jesus Christ. And I better not let my life and my stuff get more important than her value. Or I don't even understand why he lives in me. I'm being real strong and straight for some reason like this this morning. Watch this. If that's not true, I don't even understand why I go to church. Because that's the reason he's in us. To love the world around us. We're not here to be loved. We've been loved. We're here to become love. Because if God made man in his image and God is love, God made man to love, not need love. The only reason you grew up needing love is because man got cut off from it when he ate the tree. So we grew up in need of love, in need of esteem, in need of reputation, in need of appreciation, trying to find our value through one another. That's why we were hurt so bad. Offended, rejected. You're not rejected anymore. You've been accepted in the beloved. You're grafted back in. You're in the vine. You're a fruitful branch. Come on. You're not in need. You've become. I don't need you to love me. If you do, that's awesome. I am so fulfilled in love, it's ridiculous. I don't need you to acknowledge me, honor me, show me attention. I'm fulfilled in Christ. To know the love of Christ is to be filled with all the fullness of God. I want you to like me. I want to get along. I want to be family in the body of Christ. But I will not put a weight on your shoulders so that if you don't fulfill that, I'm affected and diminished. That would disappoint me and cause you to fail. I'm called to love you, not expect of you. Because if I put that on your shoulders and I need him to be something so I'm okay, then he's Lord. Come on. Don't you say, well, I would be more if it wasn't for so-and-so. Well, I just didn't feel too loved in that church. Well, you didn't go there to be loved. You went there to love. If you understand why you're saved. Well, yeah, but people just do me wrong all the time and just hurt me wrong. And I don't know why they... And all of a sudden, you let them be the reason for who you are. And you're no stronger than the weakness around you. And you've been identified by life instead of the Christ that's in you. You guys good? Am I making sense? Come on, it's strong in my heart. Can you tell how strong it is in my heart? It's God wanting to father us into this thing because he wants us to do well because he's found people that are willing to do well. I wouldn't cry this out if you weren't on page. Come on, why does God preach revolutionary stuff? Because he's found revolutionists. People that if they'd hear and get understanding, they'd say yes. And I'm just believing he's found a crowd like that today. That's saying, you know what? I'm going to gain understanding from this. I'm going to put off the petty things. I'm not going to let things rule me anymore. I'm going to grow in Christ and be with Christ. And who he is in me is going to shine. People are going to know him because I'm alive. You get it? Or you could be another hurt Christian if there's any such thing. Heaven doesn't understand what a hurt Christian is. The church sure does. We accommodate that. We sympathize with that. We understand why they're hurt. And we make them a victim and the person a villain. And our hearts are hard while we're ministering. They did what to you? Oh, my God. They shouldn't. Have. Honey. Oh, honey. I'm so sorry they did. Oh, baby. God. That is not Jesus. You're teaching them and giving them permission to be broken. You're teaching them that men's wrongs dictate your life. That is not Jesus, guys. You think it's Jesus, but it's human sympathy. And the only reason we give it so quickly is because we carry the same pains. Come on. Are you okay?
Are you guys hearing what I'm saying? Yes. Come on, Sister Sally's in the church. She's the sweetest thing there ever was. She walks by a flower out of season and it blooms. She's precious. And then somebody does her wrong and we're so offended because she so doesn't deserve it because she's the sweetest thing that ever lived. And now we're angry and hateful towards him and all we want to do is, oh, Sally. And then the only reason we pray for that person is because we're mad at him. And no wonder they don't change because we don't love them. We're mad at them. Come on, Sally's lost, lost nothing. She's still precious. She's still in Jesus. Sally doesn't have a problem. The person's in trouble. And you hug Sally for a minute and you say, man, I'm really sorry they treated you that way. You know, you're really okay, right? Because it has nothing to do with you and who you are. Don't take that personal. That would be deception, honey. Don't you even cry over that. Man, we ought to feel so sad for him. Do you realize that he mustn't see and understand? Oh my goodness, Sally, that's right. Somebody cheats on somebody and, and we make them a villain and the one cheated on a victim. You let my wife cheat on me, I will cry for her. I won't even know how to cry for myself. My wife doesn't owe me anything. I love her. The world's 50-50. The five needs of men, the five needs of women. That's the world. Throw that out of your believing. Because if you're subject to the five needs of your spouse, you're always running the risk of not fulfilling them and you're the reason they're not okay. That's stupid. That is not the church. The church is love. It's not human psychology. Is that okay if I talk that plain? I'm not being offensive. I want it to sound foolish so you stop thinking that way. Who's married here? Are you guys married? So if she has these five needs and you believe their needs and you want to love her and be sensitive to that and just fulfill that in Christ because you're a man of God, that's one thing. But if it becomes a doctrine, a psychological, and now you have to be sensitive to that, now you're fulfilling that as a servant instead of a spouse. Next thing you know, you're subject to fail and she has a reason to not be okay because you missed one. Come on, that's insane. That's insane. But somehow we go, yeah, that makes sense. It's called the way that seems right to men, but its way always leads to death. But it's sure, hmm, well, you read it in a book. Wow, that makes sense. And then you preach it. God forbid that if my wife, if I'd go home from this trip and find something like that out, God forbid that the best I could do is go in a bedroom and just cry for me. And not have the capacity to see that if my wife was in that position, something dark has shadowed her soul. There is something in her that is so wrong. And God help her and show her mercy. Why would I be so crushed if I'm love? Or do I believe she wakes up for me? Yeah, but you're in covenant. She's your wife. You enjoy... I gave myself to her to be one with her. I didn't say, I love you. Do you love me? I just said, I love you. Here's my vows to you. I'm not there to hold up her vows. Her to hold up her vows. I'm there to live true to mine. I'm not her accountability partner. I'm her husband and I love her. So if she goes AWOL, that should make me cry for her because truth is so amazing. She mustn't be seeing it. It's too easy to be another hurt human being, another statistic, another one that just needs nurtured. It's the easiest thing on the planet. It's called flesh. I know a lot of people aren't used to this kind of preaching right here. This stuff is extreme the whole because it's wrecked so many people and there's people that carry what a spouse did to them for the rest of their life and it's still in their language. And 20 years later, you can still see the hardness when they talk. That's a tragedy when you let somebody potter you like that when he's the great potter and the Christ is actually living down inside of you. God forbid you let him be so suppressed because you have your eyes on the wrong thing. And it's not because we're evil, it's because we don't understand. But here's the key, I'm calling you into understanding. So if I give you this kind of message, you've been set up because now you've heard. 
And now you have an eternal conviction. And you have to decide what you're going to do with what this man that's ranting this morning is saying. But when I'm talking, you can hear its truth, can't you? Yeah. You're not even wrestling with it because it's Jesus. Because it's exactly how he loved us. And he didn't say, sing to me and pray to me. He said, follow me. And he said, as the Father sent me, so I send you. We just think that's miracles. Come on. We go on this power surge and I'm into the power of God. But we're not on a power surge. We're becoming love. And the power flows through love because we're healthy and rooted and grounded. We're not weird and flighty and flaky. We're not on a power trip. We're sons of God. You follow me? Yeah. I don't want to heal the sick and be offended at my brother. I want to love my brother and heal the sick. <laughs> don't push into healing the sick. Push into the love of God and you'll see the sick healed. Because faith works through love. You following me? Listen, if you're in this sanctuary and I'm speaking and you had anything in your life that was defining you, anything that you had. I just need prayer. I just need to get through this. God's working me through this. No, change your view. Today, you can change your eye. You can say, man, I'm just seeing this wrong. I'm holding them so accountable. I'm making them my reason for not being okay. And they're the one hurting. I probably should consider praying for them and praying that God touched them in his mercy and love them and increase them. And bless them. I was. Was in my office. A wife had just left a husband. It's, it's a sad thing man. It hurts. It's a sad thing. You wish it wouldn't have to happen right. But there has to be an answer. She just got on the internet. And got playing around. And was sure she fell in love. Well she's already married. What are you even doing on the internet? Because there's unfulfilled expectations. There's unresolved things. And the longer they're married, the farther they grow apart. And they have a marriage and they have two young children, but they don't have intimacy anymore in the sense of I into me, you see. They don't have, I'm not talking about sex. I'm talking about intimacy. And all of a sudden they have unresolved conflicts and, and go to bed with anger and they don't make right the wrongs and that stuff builds. The next thing you know, you look at somebody and your heart doesn't see what you used to see. So you get on the internet, now you have needs. Now you're needs driven. Now you're unfulfilled because you're putting your value in flesh instead of who the one is that lives inside of you. And all of a sudden she falls in love. Watch this. It's impossible for her to love that person on the internet. It's not love. It's deception. It's emotional fantasy. It's concocted through hurt and letdown. It's total deception and demonic. There is no way he, she can love him. God is love. It's a human reaction of emotion to her pain. And she's using it as a healing, a surgery, and a band-aid. And it's a lie. You don't fall in love. You become love so you can see clear. And out of the fullness and the strength of God in your life, you enter into a relationship, not because you need them and they make your world spin. And I don't know what I'd do without you. And then they go, oh. That is the world. Are you guys okay? You're not hearing me mean, I hope. Because I am so not mean inside. But I cry over how we get hurt by not understanding these things and how good people spin and toil. Good people spin and toil because we don't understand. People that honor Jesus for dying for them, but don't understand the grace that allows them to become like him and look through his eyes. And then they're still letting life define them instead of the one that they actually do love. That's why I talk like this. Not because we're bad, mischievous people. Not because this church has sin. Because we're actually good people that are trying to do right and we're destroyed for the lack of knowledge. So in all you're getting, get understanding. It doesn't say in all you're getting, get blessing. In all you're getting, get understanding. 
because it'll transform my life. If a man's perspective can change, his whole life can change. True? And isn't the gospel all about bringing light? Isn't his word the entranceway of light? Doesn't his word make us see so there's light on the trail so we can walk a straight and narrow path? That's why we teach and train and sharpen so we grow up into him in all things. This lady got on the internet and fell in love. It's absolutely a false, it's a farce. I went to her and I told her why she can't be in love. She already had plane tickets. She already filed for divorce. She was going to go sleep with a man she met over the internet. Just jump in his arms because she found love. And I said, you're married. Are you kidding me? Christ lives in you. What are you doing? She said, I'm just tired of being good. It's never really paid off. I'm ready to have fun. I said, fun. You're going to go put your, yourself in the arms of a man you don't even know. Satisfy his own dysfunction for a moment. Lick his wound for a moment. And call it love. And need's going to meet need and lick each other and nobody's going to get healed. And that's fun. That's deception. That's self-centered, self-focused deception. And she said, well, I'm doing it. And I bawled. Oh, I bawled. And I walked away. Bawled. She did it. He went in his bedroom for five days. Screaming like a madman. The husband. So all of a sudden, his whole world shifted. See, we got to work things out. I understand that he probably wasn't being the husband he should be. And I understand the counselor could sit and say, well, you really took her for granted. And you really. And, but in the counsel, they're giving her permission to be the way she is. When love covers a multitude of sin and mercy triumphs over judgment. And Jesus is just okay. See, the guy here, Christians, talk about being emotionally abused. You try to emotionally abuse me. You will get emotionally abused trying to emotionally abuse me. <laughs> How do you emotionally abuse somebody that knows who they are? It's impossible. For you to abuse me emotionally is a joke to me. Like for me to put boundaries around my life to protect me from you is a joke to me. What am I so vulnerable of? What am I protecting? If I'm protecting, he's not my defense. Why am I so afraid of you hurting me? Well, you got to put up boundaries, brother, so you don't get hurt again. Why are we hurtable? Come on. Was Jesus hurt? Is God hurt? Is he in us? Are we made for his image? Are we the body of Christ? Probably ought to be hurt. He's in his bedroom, screaming and ranting and raving for five days. God, God, you got to bring her back. God, because see, like five, six days later, he can walk into my office. He's bawling uncontrollably. Now, what are you thinking as a pastor when he comes through the door bawling? You're thinking, oh, boy, this is tight. He's not doing well. Time's taking its toll. I got to pastor him, but it's going to be tough, God, because I have to speak truth to this man. I got to pull him out of this. I got to give him a reason to stand. It's like when I went over to another lady's house when her husband left her and she's in her, in her little, little sleep clothes in her living room crying. Her kids are sleeping. I said, honey, do you mind if I go over there? She says, honey, I know you. You go just be a pastor. And, and she didn't go with me. Our kids were at home. I just ran in her house. She's standing in the living room trembling, crying because her husband's gone with a woman. She's broken. Cry. Oh, I just cried as I walked across the room. I just cried. Doesn't mean I can't be sensitive. But I'm not going to sympathize you and allow you to stay there. I'm going to let you understand that I understand that this is not fun. But it's not who you are. And it doesn't have to rule the rest of your life. And I remember holding her and she just, it just held her like she was my own daughter, my own sister. And I'm okay in that position. I'm cool with that. God's okay too. You might not be. You might have a different theology. But I'm a pastor and I'm okay. I'm holding her and I'm crying. And I said, I'm so sorry he made this decision, kiddo. I'm sorry, this is the way it has to be right now. And I just wept with her and she's. Hoo, 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 hoo. And as soon as she started heaving and crying, I just pushed her away and looked right in the face. Now you listen to me and you listen good. And then I spoke truth and pulled her out of that thing that she was crying over. You follow me? I let her know that I understand. But this is not where you're staying. Because I cried for real because it's not fun. 
I don't like that a Christian gets so deceived they go sleep with another woman. That's a problem. It shakes me when we go to church and intercede with them for years and go to home group and watch them worship and now they're sleeping with another woman. It freaks me out the capacity of flesh when you don't stay close to God. When you don't guard your heart for out of your heart flows the issues of life. It's amazing what flesh is capable of apart from Jesus. And it sobers you. And it makes you like me. Can you hear the passion in me? Can you hear I'm talking stern? It's not because I'm mad at people. It's because this thing is real. And this is real. This is not a religion. We're not serving a doctrine. We are the people of God. We are a family. Well, this man come over to my office. He's crying so hard. It's ridiculous. And I'm thinking, oh, God, help me because I have to talk to him. I got to pull him out of this. He comes through the door and he knows me. They, my, my folks know me. They know where I They know how I am. You come in my door for counsel, you know you're getting truth. But you know I love you. But I ain't soft-pedaling nothing. I've asked married couples because they won't cooperate in a marriage. I ask them if they're born again. I said, wait a minute, I'm confused. We've been here five minutes. We're making no headway. You won't look at him. He won't look at you. Are you guys saved? What do you mean, are we saved? Are you saved? Well, yeah. Well, you sure don't look like it or act like it. So let's get a grip because I don't see one thing about Jesus in your life right now. No wonder you're hurting. You've got your eyes off of him and on each other. And I can't help you if you don't get real and get born again right now. That's how I talk to people when the doors close because I am not going to let you play that with your flesh and give yourself a permission to have those rights when you're telling me you denied yourself. Well, then deny yourself. Don't tell me, well, you don't know how I feel. What's that have to do with anything? What did you give yourself to? Well, I just don't feel like forgiving right now. You just got to give me time. You just got to give me time. Back off. I just don't want to forgive. Forgive me time. Knock it off. Where do you get the right to buy time? You died, remember? Face it. And I understand it hurts. And I understand it's inconvenient. But don't justify your flesh and raise it from the dead. Because you will live integrated. Incorporated. It's not Jesus incorporated. It's Jesus is Lord. <laughs> Look, you didn't incorporate him into your life. He became your life. You didn't invite him into your heart. He overtook you. <laughs> so, so she says, he says, don't worry, Pastor. It's not what you're, it looks like. It's not what you think. I'm really okay. I went, really? She's bawling profusely. Really? You're really okay? Yes, I heard the Lord. I said, what he said. Watch this. You guys are going to like this. I'm going to close with this. This is where I camped. Are you okay that I camped here this morning? Yes. We could do a hundred different things today and it could be church. But I have to go with where I'm at. Okay. Because we come here to stir each other for love and good works. That's first and foremost. That's why we're here. We're not just here for what God can do for us. We're here for how he can make us more like him. Amen. That ought to be priority. He said to me, I heard God. I said, what did he say? He said, well, for five days I was in the bedroom screaming like a madman. He said, I was yelling at the ceiling. I was yelling at the walls. And I was saying, God, where are you? God, where are you? How could you let this happen, God? You've got to bring back my wife, God. God, where are you? He said he was just freaking out for five days doing that. He said and God left it go on for five days. And he said the presence of God, the tangible awareness of God came in the room and stilled him just enough to listen. And he said when he got still, he said when I got still, I knew God came in the room and I went. And I'm, you know, he's thinking God's here. Because it was tangible. And it wasn't one of them overwhelming God didn't. Because God could have turned up the heat and just floored him, right? God just gave him an awareness that, I'm here, son. And he just was aware that God was there. And here's what God said to him. He said, why have you been praying this way all these days? You do not have a problem. The average pastor doesn't understand that comment. But God does. Watch. Why have you been praying this way for five days? You don't have a problem. 
And watch what he did. What do you mean? I don't have a problem. What is this, some kind of joke to you? What are you, a comedian now? What is this, a joke? My kids don't have a mother. I'm holding divorce papers. My wife's in the arms of another man. Hear the justification? Hear the natural wisdom? And he's screaming at God. He said the veins were blowing out of his neck. He said, and you're going to come in my room and tell me I don't have a problem? He said he was screaming at God like he's never screamed at a human being. He said, and God, as calm as could be, said, it's exactly what I said. You don't have a problem. Your wife is in trouble. And the only one you could cry for for five days is you. And I thought you died. Well, she cheated on me. I can leave now. That's the counsel. I don't know if I could ever trust again anyway. I might as well move on. Well, if God thought that way about you, he'd have never sent his son. Don't you get condemned if you've been divorced and don't you get condemned if you made those decisions. But we ought to learn from now and we ought to do right and let God redeem. Are you guys okay? Can you hear the wisdom of God and what he told that man? Because be honest with me. Our emotions are so in charge a lot of times and our natural wisdom and it's even integrated into the church that even ministers don't understand what God said to that. We think they need sympathized with. And God said, why are you crying for yourself? You haven't even considered her. And I weep for her. She is lost. And I'm in you and you're okay. You're not sleeping with another woman. She's lost. You're my son. Why are you crying? I'm serious. We just sang an amazing song. You're my everything. And you're all I need. The reason he's our everything is not because he meets all our needs. It's because without him, we have no identity. And without him, we're in the rat race of life trying to find ourselves. And it's every man for himself and it's survival of the fittest. But once he shows up, we know who we are. And he's our everything because he defines our life. And the reason he's all I need is because I'm reconnected again back to love. And love fulfills me. And now I don't need love. I have it. And I've become it. And my friends, it is the Christian life. It's not going to heaven. It's becoming love. The cross of Jesus is not fulfilled and paid in full when a man prays a prayer to get his name in the book of life. The cross of Jesus is fulfilled when his nature is restored back to the image of God. Because that's when he's fulfilling why he's on the planet. So mercy woke every one of us up today to give us one more day to look like our daddy. So throw the privilege of offense and anger and first impressions and judgments and presumption out of the window in your life. And don't ever give it a voice again. Because the Bible says you judge no man according to the flesh. Why? Because you see every man for his destiny, his potential, because blood has been shed. So every man must have high value. <laughs> so don't ever walk in a room again and assess the room. Walk in a room and be love. Don't ever go to a room to see if people are loving. It ought to be you're there. Because if you go to be loved, you might be disappointed. And then you might leave and you might tell two friends that that place isn't loving and now you might be working on the wrong team. You guys okay? Can I pray over you guys? Man, there's so many things we could have done this morning, but I have to go with where my heart is. You can minister for an hour and a half and pray for people and prophesy. Who knows that's true? Or you can say what God's saying and believe you're right. Let's believe I'm right today. So I'm not taking a ballot on that. I have to believe that so my conscience is clear. I'm not going to take a vote. I'm believing that's what God's saying to us as a church. Let's be the most loving people Boulder's ever seen. Let's don't be, yeah, I'm a Christian. I go to city on a hill. Let's be city on a hill. Let's let our light so shine before men that they see our lives lived and go, wow, there is a God. Arise, shine, church, your light has come. You're not people with a lot of issues and problems. You're people with amazing answer. 
and it's life in Jesus Christ. Can I pray over y'all? Father, I bless this house and I bless every person in this place. I bless every individual heart, every individual soul. I bless marriages and families and children. I just thank you for an impartation of wisdom, God. I thank you for a healing and restoring of hearts. I thank you that you turn perspectives today in such a way that pains that never went away would just leave because they see different. God, they don't need deliverance. They need to see different. God, I thank you the pain just leaves because they see different. And I thank you they realize they're not a victim. They're a recipient of the kingdom of God and that you've loved them. And that if men didn't appreciate them or see who they are, they don't have to harden their heart and turn from men. They just realize that men don't understand. But God, you know. So, Father, we're not hard-hearted people. We're not running scared and we're not pressed down. We've been lifted up. And I bless this house and I thank you for the revelation that's here. I thank you for the gospel that's growing in this place. I thank you for the move of your spirit. I thank you for an increase in the release of just your healing power, your anointing, your discernment. But God, above it all, I thank you that this place is known for their love. Because if this place is known for their love, God, all those other things will be evident and prominent. So I bless this house and I thank you. It's a house of mercy, a house of forgiveness and never a house of offense. I just proclaim that there will be no divide here. There will be no root of bitterness here. There will be no defiling of many. I thank you that you convict the heart of every individual to be a family member. And I thank you that you give us the grace to let go of rights and become who you are. Father, I bless this house and I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.